Hi everybody, well these are certainly strange days as we deal with this unprecedented situation caused by the coronavirus. At this time, as far as I know, no one in our church family has been diagnosed with the virus. But when or if that were to happen, we will get through this and go through this together as a family, as a church family. Because of the extraordinary circumstances, I have decided to step away from our series on That's Why They Call Grace Amazing for today and instead speak to what the Bible has to say about fear, worry, and anxiety because there's a lot of it going around these days. Lots of people are afraid and you can't blame them. In fact, anyone not feeling a bit of uncertainty and apprehension might be in some denial right now. So today I want to talk with you about fear from Matthew chapter 8. It says, When he, that is Jesus, got into the boat and his disciples followed him, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Before I go any further, I want to thank my studio audience. They were all very excited to volunteer to be here today to make this feel as realistic as possible. You guys will get the $5 each that I promised you if you were still here and still awake by the end of my talk. Where's Phil? Well, they say experts have identified 535 specific and unique phobias. So here's a little test of your phobia knowledge. Aranacrophobia, I'm not sure how to pronounce these, is the fear of spiders. I have that one. Claustrophobia, the fear of small spaces. I also have that one. Apahendiphobia, the fear of snakes. I have that one. This next one I do not have, erythrophobia, the fear of red. Be bad if you had that one to an OU game. Then there's one that's the longest words, perturnamarahanophobia, the fear of flying, or as John Madden calls it, the fear of crashing. There's one I don't have, crinophobia, the fear of dogs. Another one I do have, Acrophobia, the fear of heights. There is tyrannophobia, the fear of needles, which I have. That's the ex same expression on my face when I go to get a, a shot. There's one we have here in Oklahoma, astrophobia, the fear of thunder and lightning. We can throw in tornadoes also to just scare the heck out of ourselves. There's acrophobia, the fear of situations in which escape is difficult. And then there is nerophobia, the fear of death. Did you know that in the Bible, Jesus over 100 times asked people questions? And some of the questions were like, who do people say that I am? Why was it necessary that the Messiah would have to suffer? Why do you call me Lord and then not do what I say? Or why do you try to, try to take the speck of sawdust from your neighbor's eye when you have a plank in your own eye? And then the question that he asked that we're going to talk about today, he asked on more than one occasion, why are you so afraid? Now here's a theological question for you. If you had to guess, what do you think is the most common command in the Bible? The most frequent instruction that God has given to the human race. Interestingly, it's not be more loving, although the Bible certainly says a lot about being more loving. It's not pray more or study the scriptures more, even though those are important too. The most common command in the Bible is fear not. Do not be afraid. You can trust me, God says, so fear not. This phrase is found 365 times in the scriptures. One fear not for every day of the year. Webster's Dictionary defines fear as an awareness of or anticipation of danger. And as many of you know, fear has the power to snatch the joy and the peace right out of our lives. Fear can affect us emotionally, physically, 
relationally, even spiritually. And while the fear of spiders or snakes or heights are very real, I pretty much have all three. In all my years of life, I've never been bitten by a snake or a spider, and I've never fallen from a high distance. However, when it comes to more serious uh, issues, the odds are not so good. They say at least one in four of us will get cancer in our lifetimes. 50% of our marriages will end in divorce. Will there be another recession with this pandemic we're experiencing right now? Certainly the financial ramifications are going to be significant. People that we love, even family members, are going to die. There will be car accidents. There will be illnesses. There will be jobs lost. There will be betrayal of friends. Um, and they say one in four girls uh, under the age of, by the time they reach 18, will have been sexually assaulted or molested. There will be financial hardships. There are lots and lots of serious fears that people face these days. But did you know that about 8,000 people a year in our country are bitten by venomous snakes? On average, only 12 people die. But these are serious issues, affecting millions and millions, and even with this current situation, billions of people. And if they haven't had an effect on your life yet, most of them will. You're probably thinking, thank you, Russ, so much for this, these cheerful, uplifting words. Yeah, but wait, let me get to the good part. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus said, Why are you so afraid? And if Jesus were to ask you the same thing right now, what would you say if he asked you, Why are you so afraid? What is the fear about? Well, first, a little background. Jesus has just spent the entire day teaching large masses of people, healing people, just being swarmed by needy people. And so he says to his disciples, Hey, guys, we need to take a break. Let's jump in this boat and head to the other side of the lake. Now, the body of the water that they were on was the Sea of Galilee, but it really was more of a lake than a sea. It was only 13 miles long and 8 miles at its widest point. And the boats in that day would have been about 20 to 30 feet long, obviously made out of wood. Then it says, Without warning, a furious storm hit. The Sea of Galilee is about 680 feet below sea level. That is, it's in a sunken basin and has mountains on all sides. And the winds and will whip down the mountains and swirl around and create sudden and dramatic storms. Now some of Jesus' disciples, as you know, were fishermen. They had no doubt been through many stormy nights before. But apparently, nothing quite like this. I don't know if you've ever been close to drowning. I would have to think it would be one of the most terrifying and horrifying experiences you could go through. When I was a kid growing up in Miami, Oklahoma, we had a large community swimming pool, and we would ride our bikes there every day of the summer and swim. And I remember one day a girl with very long hair got her hair caught in one of the ladders, the metal ladders that you climb in and out of the pool on. She was just a foot or so below the surface but she was caught and she could not get her head above uh, the surface of the water. And the lifeguards jumped in. No one knew what to do. It was just, it's a panic. And she jerked her head around enough to where she actually tore a big clump of her scalp, uh, skull scalp out. And it was bleeding. It was horrible, but she was at least still alive. I mean, drowning would have to be a terrifying thing. And these were grown men in the boat with Jesus. Many of them were very experienced with storms, and yet this one was so severe, so terrifying, they were on the verge of losing it. Another interesting thing about this story is it's the only time in the Bible that it says Jesus was sleeping. Now, we know he slept, just like everyone else, but uh, what an unusual time for him to be asleep. Well, after bailing water and fighting the storms as long as they could, Peter finally said, hey, somebody wake up Jesus. And I'm not sure anybody really wanted to, but somebody finally did. And when he was awakened, Jesus looked around and he said, Why? Why are you so afraid? You have little faith. And they were probably like, Look around. The boat is about to capsize and break apart. That's why we're so afraid. We were, we were afraid we're all going to die. And it says that Jesus stood up, rebuked or chastised the winds and the waves. Immediately it was dead calm. The water was smooth as glass. And the disciples, of course, 
are standing there with their jaws dropped, looking at him going, my gosh, that's not even possible. We knew this guy was the Messiah, but never thought he could do anything like this. You know, as advanced as science and technology are today, despite man's best effort, we still haven't been able to come up with ways to control nature. Tornadoes, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, droughts, and even some illnesses and plagues. But what man cannot do, God can. And from this story and from Jesus' question, why are you so afraid? I want to talk with you about four very important things. Number one, even when we follow Jesus faithfully, storms will still come into our lives sometimes. The passage starts out by saying, then Jesus got into the boat and his disciples followed him. You know, for most of us, when we were young, naive Christ followers, we were just sure that God would make our voyage across the sea of life easy and trouble-free. We were hoping for a nice ride on a cruise ship, but what instead turned out to be a battleship. Not only have we been shot at, at the, by the enemy, we have also experienced some really rough weather at sea. The disciples see Jesus get in the boat, and they're probably thinking, well, as long as we follow Jesus, as long as he's with us, Everything is going to be fine. Better think again. Jesus often said the rain falls on the just and the unjust. In other words, the storms of life strike everybody sooner or later. Lesson number two, though sometimes it seems as if God is asleep, he is still present. There's a song we sing here called Lord of Eternity. And there's a part that says, some, says sometimes I call out your name. But I cannot find you. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Like, God, where are you? Why is this terrible thing happening to me? Where are you when I need you? In Mark chapter 6, there's a similar story. But this time the disciples get in the boat while Jesus goes up onto the mountainside to pray. Again, one of those sudden violent storms comes down on the Sea of Galilee. It says that it was evening, so it was dark outside. And a boat in the middle of the lake, a mile or two out there with no lighting, it would have been pitch dark. But notice the next part. It says that he saw his disciples straining at the oars. Through the distance and through the darkness, Jesus saw them and what they were going through. Now out on the boat, they were probably thinking, man, where is Jesus when we need him? He doesn't even know what we're going through. But he did know. And he saw it pretty soon. He walks down from the mountainside out into the water and he saves them that time when you first found out that your spouse had been unfaithful that time when you or your loved one were rushed to the emergency room that time when you got that dreaded call in the middle of the night you know god knows god sees he is not asleep a third important takeaway today when the storms of life strike the best thing you can do is call out to god I was talking with someone recently and he said, all my life I've been self-sufficient. He said, I think men are taught to be that way. I can handle it. I don't need anybody's help. But when things get bad enough, like they did for the disciples out on that sinking boat, the smart thing to do is to look to God. One of my favorite passages about adversity coming into our lives is in 2 Corinthians 4, where it says we are pressed on every side by troubles but we are not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We are persecuted, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we're not knocked down. All right, fourth and final, learn to trust in the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God simply means that all things are under his rule and jurisdiction. Now we can all understand the disciples fear that night. If you were and I were in a small wooden boat and the rains and the winds were throwing the boat around and big waves were filling it with water and about to capsize it, if not break it all together, and it was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, and you didn't have a life jacket, and there were no flares to shoot off, and the Coast Guard rescue was not on the way, you would be filled with fear too. So when Jesus said, Oh, you of little faith, he was communicating to them that there is real no, no real reason for fear. Because I, the Sovereign Lord, I am right here with you. Remember the 23rd Psalm. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear as long as God is with me. Earlier, I listed some things that really can strike heart, fear in the hearts of all of us. 25% or more of us will get cancer at some point in our lives. Half our marriages will fail. Financial setbacks are inevitable. Problems at school or work, people that we love die. There will be car accidents and illnesses and layovers and betrayals and lots. There's a lot of, a lot of bad things that happen in life. The good part is that God knows and God sees and God cares. And if you'll cry out to him, he will hear you. And even though you may get knocked down, you don't have to stay down because all things are under the control of our sovereign God. With this coronavirus that's going around and all the fear and panic that it has uh, brought about in many of our lives, in many of our hearts, uh, we have to remember that we can always, always, always trust God. Let's pray. God, I pray that all of us will grow stronger and deeper during this difficult time. And remember all the times you've been faithful to us in the past and brought us through and that you will also this time. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.